Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Let's start our seminar for today. Today I have a pleasure to present Professor Michael Larsen from Indiana University in the United States. He will speak on portions of normal subgroups in simple groups. Uh, please, Professor, you can start. Okay, well, thank you very much, and thank you so much for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, so let's see if I can uh, do this. Uh, so my, my, uh, are my slides visible? Okay, I'll assume that they are. And please, if you have uh, questions, uh, I don't really know how to use this, this Google meeting, so just, just uh, speak up, please. Um, okay, so I want to talk about uh, some joint work with Aner Shalev and uh, Fam Tiep. Uh, on um, the question of whether if you have a normal subset S in a simple group, S times S inverse uh, is equal to G. So, okay, so this is the setup. Uh, we'll look at the set of X, Y inverse, where X and Y are in S, and S is uh, a, a union of uh, conjugacy classes, of some conjugacy classes in a, a simple group G. And we'll say that S covers G if uh, every element in G can be written as X, Y inverse for some X and Y in S. And uh, the conjecture, which I want to talk about, it's still a conjecture, uh, says that um, in a non-abelian finite simple group, uh, every normal subset, which is sufficiently large in terms of the uh, fraction of elements uh, that it contains, um, will cover G uh, if G is sufficiently large. That is to say, for any epsilon, uh, an epsilon fraction of elements of G is, is enough to guarantee that S uh, covers G if uh, G is sufficiently large. Um, so there, if, if you kind of need all the hypotheses, uh, if uh, G isn't simple, well, uh, it can have an index two subgroup, which would be a counterexample. If it's Z mod PZ, if though it's a billion simple, uh, you could have a quite large set, which doesn't cover. And if, if you don't assume that S is normal, this definitely isn't true. You can uh, construct, um, first you can fix some element of G that you want to avoid, and then construct S by adding elements one at a time. Uh, and you can get up to half of the elements uh, while making sure each time you add a new element that uh, G still can't be represented as SS as inverse. Uh, so you, you kind of need the setup we have. Um, Notice, by the way, that if, if uh, S contains more than half of the elements in G, then it, it automatically covers G. It doesn't need to be normal. It's just uh, combinatorially uh, clear. Okay, so uh, there are similar problems. And in, in fact, um, I'll mention a couple of them. One is instead of taking quotients, we could have taken products. Uh, and um, if we did that, then we have to be a little bit more careful because there is a, a special question about the identity when you deal with, with S squared. The, the issue is the following. I mean, if you, th if you think about um, a group G in which most conjugacy classes are not real, that is to say that uh, say for most elements, X, X and X inverse are not conjugate to each other, then what you can do is you can uh, partition the conjugacy classes, most of the, most of the elements belong to conjugacy classes, so you can, sort of separately consider the conjugacy class of X and of X inverse, and you just choose one or the other um, for each X, uh, except for those X's which, uh, which are real. Uh, so then you can get up close to half of the elements uh, without ever having both X and X inverse in, in the same conjugacy class. But except for that, we would expect the same thing to be true. We would expect that S squared would probably hit uh, all, but, all but the identity in, in G, assuming that S contains more than epsilon G elements. We can also consider the idea of two separate normal subsets, each of which has at least epsilon times uh, G elements. And again, you can ask whether um, the product contains everything with the identity. Um, this seems to be a more difficult thing. And, and in fact, there are a number of interesting cases where we know that this does not happen. I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Um, we could ask for more than two sets. For example, we could have uh, three sets each. Grade. Of course, if you have more sets, it's easier to, to cover. Uh, and we could ask, suppose we have three sets with at least epsilon G elements. 
Uh, and in, in that case, the answer is it does contain G. This is a theorem of Gower's, and you don't even need to assume that the sets are, are normal, and you don't need to assume that the group G is simple. All you need to assume is that it's quasi-random in the sense of Gower's, which uh, means it has no non-trivial um, uh, representations of low degree. Okay, so let me begin by uh, talking about what happens with uh, the alternating groups. And uh, here, uh, something stronger is true. This goes back to something that uh, uh, Nair and I uh, proved some years ago, uh, which is that if you choose a random element of a large alternating group, then um, with probability of, uh, approaching one, the conjugacy class of that element alone is enough to cover the alternating group. Um, now, of course, no single uh, conjugacy class for a large alternating group will have a, an epsilon proportion of the elements in the group. And nevertheless, um, a, a single conjugacy class is usually enough. So this, this is a, a stronger theorem than, um, than the conjecture that we're trying to prove, but of course, only in the case of alternating groups. And um, let me try to uh, sketch why this theorem is true. Um, so the first thing is that uh, for most elements in the alternating group, it doesn't matter whether you look at the conjugacy class of X in AN or the conjugacy class of X in the symmetric group, uh, essentially because it, with, high, with probability approaching one as N goes to infinity, um, there will always be an odd permutation which commutes with X. Not always, but the probability that there will exist such a permutation which, which commutes with X goes to one. Okay, so that's, that's uh, well known. Uh, and another thing which is, is well known is, is that most elements in the symmetric group have, if you, if you write uh, sick of X, cycles of X, to be the, the total number of cycles in the cycle decomposition, um, most elements have a small number of um, cycles compared to N. Here I, I uh, state a weak version of this theorem where logarithmically uh, this number is almost always small compared to N. In fact, the actual number of cycles you would expect is something like log of n. Uh, so certainly any, uh, any small power of n uh, is very unlikely to occur. Okay, so these two things, the first two are well known. The third, um, I think, as, well, as far as I know, is a new result that, um, uh, that Anair and I proved. So now you have two elements, x and y, and you're interested in knowing whether y can be written as a quotient of two elements conjugate to x in the symmetric group. And the statement is that if the number of fixed points of y is large compared to the number of cycles of x, then the answer is yes. And this is uh, uh, just a construction. I mean, um, it's, it's, uh, you could give an algorithm that would actually generate um, the two representatives of this of, uh, conjugacy class of x, uh, such that y was um, equal to this product. It's some version, I would say, of a, an idea which, as far as I know, goes back to Andrew Gleason in the 1960s, proved um, that every even permutation in the symmetric group can be written as a product of two n cycles. Uh, and it's, again, a kind of a constructive argument that tells you how to build those two n cycles to achieve any particular uh, uh, even element. Uh, and so the final ingredient is, is this that if you have um, both the number of fixed points and the number of cycles are sort of logarithmically small compared to n, then in fact, y will be a product, well, will, will be a quotient of a conjugate of two conjugates of x. So uh, I, I'm going to say more about why this is true, not a lot more, but a little more uh, in a minute, but I just want to uh, try to convince you that these um, statements together imply the, the theorem that I asserted in the previous slide. Um, so the point is that most of the time when you choose X, you'll have a small number of cycles. If Y also has a small number of cycles, then this last um, statement uh, gives the theorem. And if it doesn't have a small number of cycles, if it's bigger than, than N to a small power, um, then it will be almost certainly bigger than, than seven times the number of cycles of X. And so again, Y can be represented. Okay, so this is the, the strategy of proof. And now I just want to say something about the last statement on this page. So this is a, a totally different kind of argument. This is a character theory argument. It goes back to a classical theorem of Frobenius. 
um, given conjugacy classes C1 through Cn in any finite group, it doesn't have to be simple. Uh, you try to solve the equation x1 times dot 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 times xn minus 1 equals xn, where each xi belongs to its corresponding conjugacy class, and you want to count the number of solutions. And the uh, theorem of Frobenius says that the number of solutions is given by this formula, where the sum is taken over irreducible characters uh, of g. Now, I want to point out that the first uh, factor here uh, is sort of, you could think of it as, as a naive approximation of the number of solutions you would expect, right? If you imagine how many solutions, just sort of with, with a probability theory argument, which is not perfectly justified, but if you imagine trying to use it, you could say, well, the number of choices for x1, x2 up to xn, if we don't insist on this equation, is just c1 times c2 up to cn. And the probability, if you choose them at random within their conjugacy classes, that they will satisfy this equation, you would think would be something like one over the order of the group. So you would expect that this first factor is, is maybe a reasonable approximation of the number of solutions, at least um, in many cases. And if you then look at what you have to multiply it by, um, you notice the following thing. First of all, you have the trivial character, chi, chi equals one, and that contributes one. So if you had no non-trivial characters, to worry about, then, then uh, the formula would be just sort of the, the naive uh, uh, probabilistic uh, approximation. So these higher degree characters um, will perturb this a little bit, and let's think how. Well, if you, if you look at the numerator, this is a product of n character values of chi. Uh, whereas, well, each of these character values in absolute value is, of course, smaller than or less than or equal to chi of 1, but we don't know how much smaller. And the denominator only has n minus 2 of them. So you have more factors in the numerator. On the other hand, most of the time, you expect the factors in the numerator to be much, much smaller than um, each of them, to be much, much smaller than chi of 1. So the hope is that, that, that this is enough. So if you could somehow control, if you knew enough about the conjugacy classes that you could get a good upper bound um, for these character values in terms of chi of 1, then it would seem reasonable uh, to say that just this first factor gives a good approximation to the total number of solutions. Of course, what we're mostly interested in is existence of solutions rather than counting them, but the strategy for counting is to show that there are about th this number of solutions. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, and as I say, we just want to show that all the terms with chi not equal to one add up to less than what the trivial term contributes. Okay, so the character upper bounds that we need, or at least that we have, and this is this again is something we proved. Is that if you have y where the number of fixed points is small compared to n, then uh, the character value chi of y and absolute value shouldn't be much more than the one half power of chi of one. And if you have an element which has a small number of cycles, then you get a much stronger bound that the absolute value of chi of x, or if you prefer chi of x inverse, is. Uh, logarithmically much smaller than chi of 1. Okay, so if you have these two uh, estimates and you go back to the Frobenius formula, where n is equal to 3, x1 is equal to, well, c1 is the conjugacy class of, of x, and c2 is the conjugacy class of x inverse, and c3 is the conjugacy class of y, then um, what you find is you have, in this uh, expression over here, you have one copy of chi of 1 to the 1 half plus O of 1, and two copies of chi of 1 to the O of 1. So the numerator is, is chi of 1 to the 1 half plus O of 1, and the denominator is chi of 1. Um, now, in fact, uh, it is uh, known, I think this is, again, uh, due to uh, Liebig and Shalev, um, that if alpha is any constant greater than 0, and you look at alternating groups uh, as n goes to infinity, and you take the sum over non-trivial characters of chi of 1 to the minus alpha, um, that this goes to 0. So the contribution of all the terms other than the trivial character in the Fermanius formula is, um, is negligible. OK, so that's it for alternating groups. Let's move on to groups of Lie type. Uh, notice that I will not say anything about sporadic groups, because this kind of statement, by its very nature, is as asymptotic. And so the sporadic groups don't uh, play any role at all. OK, so um, of course, when you deal with groups of uh, Lie type, um, roughly speaking, they are um, uh, associated with 
uh, an algebraic group and with a finite field. So I've kind of given three examples. I think all of these actually are finite simple groups. Sometimes you have to do a small modification to, to get something which actually is a finite simple group. Um, and you sort of see, okay, this is a small group. It's a border 168. Um, this is a big group, but it's big because of large Q. This is a big group, but it's big because of large rank. So um, I, I would say in general that the kind of methods that you use to prove statements about um, the large Q limit uh, and the kind of methods you use to, to prove things in the, in the high rank limit are quite different. For the large Q limit, you can try to use methods of algebraic geometry. And that's in fact what I'm going to do. Um, for the large rank uh, case, it really doesn't seem possible, at least I've never succeeded in getting uh, algebra geometric methods to give anything at all. Um, one thing which is, which is kind of interesting is that there is a, a reasonable um, a kind of heuristic or, or philosophy, I don't know quite how to des describe it, which says that the alternating group can be thought of the alternating group AN can be thought of as SLN over the field with one element, the non-existent field with one element. So whatever that means, I think it sort of suggests that the methods you would think of trying to use for a group like this are pretty similar to the methods you might try to use for the alternating group A10,000. And since we proved the theorem in the alternating group case, you might hope that we could prove it easily in the, in the uh, high rank limit, but that Turns out not to be the case. I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Of course, you can have a group which is which is big for both reasons, uh, a big group and, and a big field. Um, and OK, so you'll see um, exactly what we can and what we can't prove. OK, so I want to talk about um, the large Q limit. And the theorem which, which we proved is the following. If you fix epsilon and you fix rank, and then you set fend Q to infinity. Then the conjecture is true. Every normal S with at least this number of elements will cover G. And so that's um, what we can prove. If, if both the rank and Q are large, uh, presumably there's some relationship. You, you could probably write down a function in terms of the rank if Q is bigger than that function, um, and, and some function of rank and epsilon. You could probably make it explicit, but we didn't try to do that. Okay, so I already said we do, do not know what happens in the large rank limit, although I, I suspect the conjecture is true. I mean, yeah, the difficulty, I mean, the, the thing which goes wrong when you try to uh, mimic the methods for the alternating group, the thing which goes wrong is we don't have a constructive argument for the analog of elements which have many fixed points. So in this linear setting, what we mean by many fixed points um, would be a high dimensional eigenspace. So for example, elements of small support, I mean, if you have, let's say, take a two by two matrix and uh, then pad it with, with a bunch of ones to get an n by n matrix, an element like that, it, it, it's hard to get good character estimates for it because the centralizer is so large. It, I mean, actual character values for such elements tend to be quite, quite big compared to chi of one. And, you know. um, so character methods just don't seem to work very well. And, and so you need something else, and we don't have that something else in the, uh, yet at least in the case of, of groups of Lie type. Here's another thing which I can, can say, and, and which maybe I should have said already in the case of alternating groups. We actually know that uh, in, in the large rank limit, um, if S and T are both pretty big normal subsets, that still is not enough to imply that one, that I'm sorry, uh, that, that uh, ST contains uh, every element of G except for one. There can be other elements which are missing in S times T. And that, by the way, is also true for the alternating group. But it isn't true, it turns out, um, for uh, this fixed rank case in the large Q limit. So the proof that we give in the large Q limit would work equally well if S and T are, are different from each other. And that proof, as I say, is essentially a geometric one. Okay, so let's talk about what the geometry is. As I say, uh, we start off with a simple algebraic group and a field. Um, so we look at, at G of FQ, that may not be exactly the finite simple group. So this argument may, may have to be 
there may be some technical point that has to be worried about, but it, it's, not, it's not a significant uh, difficulty. Um, if you like, you can just think about the case of SLM. I think all the, all the real features of, of the problem are there already for SLM. And then we have an element um, which um, belongs to a target conjugacy class in G of FQ. Uh, that is to say, we want to make sure that this C can be written as an element of S times S inverse. And now here's the, the geometric setup. So I define Z to be the algebraic group G cross G times G, which actually I just want to think of as a, as a variety. Uh, and it's going to map to, to itself, but I'm going to think of this G times G in a, in a sort of different way, um, uh, as you'll see in, in, when I abstract this a little bit. Uh, it's, so it's going to map to G, G cross G by the, the morphism. It's not a homomorphism. It's just a morphism of varieties, which sends the pair G1 comma G2 to this expression. It, it, this C to the G1, I mean the G1 conjugate of C. And then we multiply by G2, and in the second coordinate, we just have G2. Okay. Why this particular function? Well, um, I claim that with this pi, um, all we need to do is show that pi inverse of S times S is non-empty. Because if it is not empty, then what can we do? Well, we, we can say that this expression over here c to the g1, g2, and this expression over here are both in S, and therefore a quotient of elements of S, c to the g1 will be a quotient of elements in S. And since S times S inverse is itself a normal subset, if we can represent c to the g1 as a quotient of elements in S, then we can likewise represent S. Okay, so this is... So, so yeah, please. Well, Michael, so what, what is c? What is c here? Okay. Uh, so you see, yeah, yeah. Oops. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, what are we trying to prove? We're trying to prove that S, S inverse is everything in the group G. So if that were not the case, there must be some element that doesn't get hit. Call that element C. Mm -hmm. Based on that uh, difficult element, we define this morphism pi. Uh. And we're going to show that, in fact, that this difficulty can't really exist, at least when Q is big. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, thanks. And please uh, interrupt and ask. Um, um, OK, so let x be, um, uh, so yes, I mean, so, so the key to, to, to doing this really is uh, the lang ve estimate, which is sort of the standard estimate that one uses um, to uh, estimate the number of points on varieties over finite, over finite fields. And so let x be an n-dimensional variety over the field fq. Um, our varieties, in fact, will, will be basically, they'll, they'll all be algebraic groups. So in fact, our, our varieties will all be affine varieties. So you can think about this in a very concrete way. We have a bunch of variables and a bunch of polynomial equations. And um, there's some algebraic way of computing the dimension of the solution set, but we want to actually count the number of solutions over FQ. And what the Langve estimate says is that the number of solutions uh, should be about what you would expect, naively, q to the n with an error term of uh, order q to the n minus a half. This makes sense if you have a particular variety and, and you count solutions over larger and larger fields. And if you do this, uh, you see that uh, this um, estimate uh, gives us the, the um, qualitative estimate we need, which is, which is quite weak. It's just q to the n plus little o of q to the n. In some sense, this is a, a Riemann hypothesis strength estimate, and this is a prime number theorem strength estimate, but it's really all that we need. However, uh, there are some difficulties in using the Langley estimate. Um, so if you think about the case of two variables and a single equation, x, y equals zero, and you, so geometrically, this is just the coordinate axes. Uh, and if you count the number of points over FQ, of course, there are Q points in the, on the x-axis and Q points in the y-axis for a total of QQ minus 1, um, no matter how big Q is. Um, and the problem, of course, is that, that this case, xy equals 0, this, the variety is, is not irreducible. 
which has two components. And that's why we end up with sort of twice the number of solutions you would expect. So we need to assume that X is irreducible. In fact, you need something uh, a little bit uh, technically stronger. You need to say that X is geometrically irreducible, which means it would remain irreducible even if you replaced FQ by a larger field, FQ bar, let's say. And an example of what can happen, which is, if you haven't seen it before, is, is kind of interesting and maybe counterintuitive. If you think about the equation x squared plus y squared equals zero, if you happen to have a, a square root of minus one, then this will factor as x plus iy times x minus iy, and so you'll end up with too many solutions. But if your q is congruent to three mod four, so you don't have any square roots of minus one, then the following interesting thing happens. If you pull the y squared over to the other side of the equation, then you're trying to solve the equation x squared equals minus y squared. And if you look at y not equal to zero, you could divide both sides of the equation by y squared. You get that x divided by y, quantity squared, equals minus one. But you have no square roots of minus one. So in fact, when q is three mod four, this equation has only one solution. So somehow, because it has two geometric components, there's a kind of a cancellation in the, in the point counting, and we get much fewer solutions than we would expect. So this is also a bad thing. In fact, from our point of view, it's maybe an even worse thing, uh, since we want to have a lot of points in some sense. Uh, so, but in any case, we're going to need to assume geometric irreducibility uh, to get Lang Bay. Another point, which is going to be very important to us, is that if you have a geometric family, um, that, that is to say, a, parametrized family of varieties x, then this implicit uh, constant in this big O term uh, can be taken to be uniform. So to give an example, suppose you're interested in, uh, in a single polynomial equation in two variables, and it's of degree 5. Well, there are, there are, of course, a bunch of coefficients that a degree 5 polynomial in two variables can have. And each of those coefficients is free to range independently. That's what we mean by the parameters. And so we can look at all the curves in this family. Some of those curves um, will fail to be geometrically irreducible. Some may even fail to be irreducible entirely. And those, point, those um, curves may have too many or too few points. But the ones which are geometrically irreducible in the family, and most of them are, um, will have about the right number of points. And, and the, the implicit constant here um, will, will be um, uniform in the family doesn't matter which quintic curve we, we take. Um, this notion of uniformity can also be used um, in, in a kind of um, sense in which we think sort of schematically rather than, a, than in terms of varieties. So what that means in practice, uh, as far as this talk is concerned, is that the parameter could include the characteristic. So for example, if we're interested in the algebraic group, I don't know, SL3, and we're interested in SL3 over all finite fields, then you know, we expect to get about Q to the eight elements. And, and that really is true with an error term of Q to the O of Q to the 7.5 uniformly in the family. Actually, of course, as you know, something even better is true in that case. But in general, this would be true for, for varieties, sort of varieties over Z, if you, if you like that terminology. Um, Okay, now the way that we want to use the Langve bound is we want to look at inverse images of finite sets with respect to morphisms. Okay, well, let me, I attributed this to Langve. I mean, I actually don't know who first made this statement. Um, it follows fairly easily from Langve. Um, I think probably the first person who wanted it just wrote it down. Um, but let me, let me state it carefully because it's kind of a key. Uh, point as far as we're concerned. Okay, so we, we start off with two varieties, z and x, and we have a dominant morphism of varieties. All of this is defined over fq. Now, when I say a dominant morphism, um, roughly speaking, this means surjective. It's a little weaker than surjective. What we don't want is that the image of z is contained in a proper subvariety of x. Um, so, Okay, so we assume that, that, that in some sense, most elements of, of X, uh, that there's no algebraic reason that most elements of X shouldn't be hit by pi. Okay, and we make a technical hypothesis, which is we assume that the fibers are generically uh, geometrically irreducible. Most of them are geometrically irreducible. Um, 
This is a hard hypothesis to check, actually, but, um, but we're going to assume it. OK, now we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a subset S of the solutions of X, of the points X of FQ. This X of FQ, I mean the points. Uh, if you like to think of X as a system of equations, I mean the solution set over FQ. And I want S to be sizable. I want it to be like an epsilon fraction of these, at least. And then what I, what I want to say is that the inverse image of the set S, so again, S is a subset of X, and we look at its inverse image in Z, the inverse image as a, a fraction of the elements of Z is about the same as, as S as a fraction of the elements of, of X with a, a, a little O of one error. Okay, so that's, that's the statement. And there's also a converse version where if you knew that this is true for all subsets S and for large FQ, um, then you could also prove that the fibers are generically geometrically irreducible. And so that is one way that you could, that you could try to do it. Um, OK, I, 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 I'm sorry about this ringing sound. Uh, I, think, I think and hope it will stop. Um, OK, so this is, anyway, this is, um, yeah, this is Lang Vey. And as I say, it's, it's exactly what we want if we could only verify the, um, the generic geometric irreducibility. Now, in fact, um, for our purposes, something a little bit weaker is, is good enough. And I want to explain this because as far as I know, this is a new concept in this paper and it seems like potentially a useful one for other things. Maybe somebody else has done it. I mean, I certainly am not prepared to claim originality. Um, but uh, yeah, okay, so here's the situation now. Z is, a, is a, a variety and it's mapping to a product of two varieties, X and Y. And we say that this, this uh, morphism respects products if the following thing is true. If when we look at subsets S of X and T of Y, and we look at the product set S, S times T inside X times Y, if we do this, then the statement that, that we talked about before is true. That is to say that the proportion of elements in the inverse image is about the same as, as the uh, proportion of elements in, in S times T. Okay, so that's, um, that's what I want to be true. This is a hypothesis on this morphism. And of course, this hypothesis would, it, I mean, this is a weaker statement than the generic geometric irreducibility of the fibers of pi, because we already saw that generic geometric irreducibility would imply that for any subset of x cross y, this kind of estimate would work. And I'm just limiting um, the claim to product subsets. On the other hand, you see, if we have this morphism pi, from z to x cross y, we can compose it with projection maps and get a morphism from z to x and a morphism from z to y. And if you think about this for a minute, I think you can convince yourself that the, the statement I want is actually stronger than the generic geometric irreducibility of both of these uh, maps. So it's somehow intermediate between saying that z behaves well with respect to x and y jointly and saying that z behaves well with x and it also behaves well with y, which are easier things to prove than saying that Z behaves well with X cross Y. Okay, and now uh, I want to uh, explain the, the kind of uh, key trick. So suppose we have a, a variety Z and a morphism to X times Y. So I wanted to find the fiber product of Z with itself relative to Y. And what I mean by that is I want to look at the variety which consists of ordered pairs of elements in Z, which have the same projection to Y. And when I take this variety, there's a natural map from this variety to X cross X, which I call Psi. And what this map does, remember that an element of, of Z cross over Y of Z is an ordered pair Z1 and Z2, which agree in their Y coordinates. So what I wanna do is I wanna look at their X coordinates and um, take that ordered pair of, of elements of X. So that defines a morphism psi. And um, what uh, uh, Anair and Tiep and I were able to, to show is that if the um, morphism pi um, 
Ah, I, I changed my notation and, uh, oh, I, okay. I stated this wrong because I changed my notation today and I didn't do it consistently. So, okay, this is what I, what I should have said. If psi respects products, if this new morphism psi respects products and pi x and pi y um, uh, have generically geometric irreducible, uh, generically geometrically irreducible fibers, then pi uh, respects products. So setting aside the technical fact that we do need pi x and pi y to, to behave well, uh, the, the real moral here is that, that to show that pi behaves well, it, it's enough to show that psi behaves well. Okay, now um, the particular case that we're interested in is the following. Z, as I say, is equal to, to G cross G, as we defined it before, and, and X and Y are each equal to G. And the morphism um, pi is the same morphism pi that we talked about before when we, when we mapped from G cross G to G cross G, which we're now thinking of as a map from Z to X cross Y. So the, the morphism is given like this. Um, and we're gonna define psi just as before. Uh, if you think about what Z cross over Y with Z is, um, it's actually three copies of G because an element of, um, well, yeah, these notations may be, um, yeah. An element of Z is an ordered pair, which we can think of as, as G1, G2. And a second element of, of G is an ordered pair, which we can think of as G3, G4. And if the Y coordinates are the same, then G2 equals G4. So we really just have three coordinates, G1, G2, and G3. And um, so we get a map if we kind of just figure out what, what the map psi is. Okay, it turns out to be this in calculation. And if we now just change the notation to be more, more like what we are used to, um, we see that, that X1, Y1, and T uh, we'll go to the following uh, thing. It'll be the X1 conjugate of C divided by the Y1 conjugate of C times T comma T, right? And that, of course, is, um, uh, I mean, that's beginning to look like the kind of thing that we want in terms of uh, uh, trying to um, look at S times S inverse. Now, in fact, um, one, uh, one step of this kind is not enough. What we really want to do is we want to perform a kind of downward induction. Yes, I'm very sorry about this drilling sound. Um, after waiting months for these people to come, they chose today uh, to come. I, I hope that the sound will go away. Um, okay, um, so we have um, Z equals now G to the power of two M plus one. X and Y are both equal to G. And we can define Psi M in this way, where we take a conjugate of C, a conjugate of C inverse, a conjugate of C, a conjugate of C inverse, we do this n times, and then we multiply by t, comma t. That's our map psi n. And if you apply the, uh, if you apply our um, uh, theorem from the previous, uh, you apply this key tool to this situation, the conclusion is that if psi 2n respects products, then uh, psi n uh, respects products as well. And so we can do this downward induction to get all the way down to showing that pi uh, respects products, assuming that we can show that for some very big n, uh, psi n respects products. And to do that, it would be enough to show equidistribution in fibers. So why do we have equidistribution in fibers? Well, uh, now we can go back to, to saying, if we know something about the characters, and we can use a very weak character statement. Here's a statement which goes back to, to David Gluck from the, from the early 90s, who says that um, in, in groups of Lie type, the absolute value of chi of g is, you know, in, in some logarithmic sense, it's a little smaller than chi of one, just a little smaller because for when dimension g is big, this exponent is very close to one. But this is still good enough it's still good enough because we can now use, um, well, we can use the Frobenius formula, 
with many, many conjugacy classes, because this n is big, we can use the Fermanius formula with many, many conjugacy classes. And then the Liebig Shalev uh, estimate um, to, to prove that uh, when n is large, uh, the trivial character dominates all uh, subsequent characters. So again, if you think about the logic, it's kind of interesting. Um, character estimates are not good enough to prove what we want, which is S, S inverse represents everything. But they are good enough to say that if we had S times S inverse times S times S inverse times S times S inverse, many factors, that then we would be able to prove that we get um, not only that we that we uh, represent every element, but we represent every element about the same number of times. That in turn has a geometric consequence, and the geometric consequence is for psi n when n is large, but because of the uh, key tool, we're able to go from larger n to smaller n and eventually get it down to the case that we want, where character estimates would not be adequate. So my, Michael, so this yeah. this result, which you just mentioned, this Liebig shalev this is true only for the Lie type, right, groups? Uh, this statement, yes, this statement is true for, for uh, groups of Lie type. That's, that is true. But do you uh -huh. mean that it's not true for alternating groups? Uh, it may be that, uh, I, mean, yeah. I, may be, I may have the wrong attribution. That is to say, uh, it may not be true that the uh -huh. same paper in which they did it for groups of Lie type, they also did it for alternating groups. But it is true uh, mm -hmm. also for, for alternating groups. I see. Yeah. Um, but I may I have see. the wrong attribution. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, all right, so this, this uh, proves the theorem, and as I say, it's... It, uh, uh, Michael, yeah. if it's true, why you could not use the same philosophy in the previous case, not for, legal, for alternative groups, when you constructed uh, the uh, explicit way uh, the solution? Why? I'm sorry. why yeah. Why, why couldn't we use it for, for, um, for the alternating groups? Yes. Well, for this amplification method, which is basically what this is, is a kind of amplification. So, I mean, yeah, let me just say, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to use large character values to cause trouble. And we're trying to say if the character values are, are a little bit bigger than we expected, um, that trouble is only visible um, when we, um, yeah, I mean, if they're only a little bit bigger than, I'm sorry, it's easy to show that they're not much bigger than what we expected. If they're only a little bit bigger than we expected, that's good enough. So we need a, a kind of an amplification method. And the amplification method uh, depends on algebraic geometry. It depends on, on Langve. There's, yes. We don't know how to, how to do an amplification argument for alternating groups. Um, so, uh, and, and it doesn't feel, I mean, the argument really is a very geometric argument, not only because it uses Langve, but, but it, it, it has a very geometric flavor. I, um, it's hard for me to imagine how something like this could be made to work for alternating groups. Um, good. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but also, I don't understand how, how to make uh, something like this work when the rank is big and Q is small. Uh, and the problem there is, is not on the side of the character theory. The character estimates work fine for any Q. The problem is the Langve estimate, the error term. Uh, the, uh, it's hard to get a good estimate for the error term. You need to send Q to infinity um, to, to, you know, you, you have a constant, an implicit constant times Q to the N minus a half and you're comparing that to Q to the M. So the constant could be quite large. It's hard to say how big it is. Okay, so I wanted to conclude by uh, saying something about a, um, a, an application of this result. So uh, here's a, uh, another theorem uh, with uh, Anea and Tia, which uh, says the following, that if, if G is a um, sufficiently large, simple transitive permutation group, then every element of G uh, can be expressed as the product of two derangements, two, el two elements without fixed points in the permutation group. And it would be nice uh, and, and possibly doable. I mean, I, I don't think this is an impossible question, but I mean, we, we thought about it, it seems hard. Um, it might be true for all simple, uh, in fact, we think it probably is true and, and might be provable for all simple 
uh, transitive permutation groups. Um, our methods are inadequate to do that, but um, if there are uh, permutation group experts here, um, you know, uh, I think it's sort of an interesting and, and maybe approachable question. Um, so let me say something about how we prove this. So a, a crucial point is a, um, a result of uh, Fulman and uh, Goralnik, um, which says that in a simple transitive permutation group, the fraction of elements which are derangements, uh, there's some absolute constant which, which you can prove that the, at least this fraction of elements are derangements. So that can be our epsilon and we can then plug it into our result and so the result says that in the, in the large Q limit, we're going to be okay. So, um, so what do you do? Um, it, what do you do if your rank is, I mean, I think the way to think about this is, is that, um, you know, this gives us a way of dealing with E8. It, it doesn't help us at all with large classical groups. So you have to have a different technique um, for dealing with SLN of F2. Right. Our, 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 um, the things I've talked about today are, are not helpful there. We deal with the alternating groups. We deal with the exceptional uh, groups of Lie type. Uh, and of course, we don't have to worry about the sporadic groups because this is an asymptotic statement. We still have to deal with the SLN of F2 type groups, the, the large the classical groups of high rank over small fields. And fortunately, uh, quite a lot is known about the um, about the large subgroups of these. If the subgroup, of course, if you have a, a simple transitive permutation group, then you're talking about a simple group and a subgroup of that simple group, which is the stabilizer of an element. And if the subgroup is small, then there's, there's no problem. You have an enormous number of fixed points. I mean, it's, that's easy. The, the difficulty is when the subgroup is large. And we know what the large subgroups uh, are. And so we can then analyze those cases uh, one by one, which is actually quite a bit of work. Um, so maybe that's uh, all that I'll say about that theorem. Um, thank you for, um, for coming. Uh, are there questions? Uh, let's thanks. First, let us thanks Professor Michael. <laughs> And now, missed questions, comments? Uh, Michael, can I ask a question? So, uh, this, this discussion about this SLN, right, for the fixed field. Yes. Uh, can, can you also think this uh, also from this algebraic geometry point of view, in a sense, like, you know, you like uh, looking at like in group, like, you know, this, 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 I mean, in this point of view, like, you know, you're increasing X, right? SLN is in better than SLN plus one, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so, so I mean, uh, you could imagine uh, something like this. Um, what, mm -hmm. what would Lang V look like in this world? Would you yeah, have, that's true. From control and cohomology. I, I, I've wondered about these, these kinds of varieties, um, what you can say about the Betty numbers, uh, it, it, you know, as n goes to infinity. My guess is that they grow rapidly, but I, I, I've never proved a theorem about it. I've never seen anybody else's theorems about it, but my guess is that they grow rapidly. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nice to see you. Michael, uh, yeah. if you replace by uh, the whole stuff by algebraic group of the of the field, not necessarily fine. Yeah. Can you somehow get a result for this case? Somehow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If you replace SLN by what? Not for finite field, not the finite group, just algebraic group. Take ah. it, yeah. Ah, so so okay, that's interesting. So what, what might what would it look like? What what? Yeah, what's going on in this case? Yeah, it's in the sense of the philosophy. Then the you say the field is growing, and the, maybe the the rank is growing. But the field, what's going on in algebraic sort of? Take, for example, algebraically closed field and consider the case. Well, what so, I mean, one, one thing you might try to do is if you have a measure, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, some yeah, kind yeah. of. Okay. So, so here is is a um, difficulty with with this question. So maybe over an algebraically closed field, um, maybe there's something you could do. Um, but uh, for the first case, I think you would think about is, is um, you, you know compact simple Lie groups. And a, a statement of this kind just isn't. So for example, SU two. A statement of this kind just isn't true for SU two. And the reason is that S could be concentrated in in a little uh, neighborhood of the identity. Uh, it could be a normal subgroup of positive measure, but it's, um, but you know, you'd have to put it to a very large power in order to cover um, the, the Lie group. So you might ask, why, why is it so bad? Right? I mean, why, why is it so hard to cover a compact Lie group with a normal what? subset? when it's so easy to do with a finite simple group. And I think the reason for this is that the, the dimensions of the representations of um, compact Lie groups, they have, they have representations of rather small dimension, whereas the uh, finite simple groups have, have large dimensional representations in some sense. At least I feel that, that there's some, some philosophy of this kind which explains this difference, but I don't really understand it. I'm not sure if, I, if I've answered your question, but that, that's my No, no, no. Uh, yeah, for example, in, group, in compact group, you can take a measure and then to ask the same question, why not? Yeah, no, I mean, that's for, for complex groups, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's an interesting question. Uh, yeah. If you have a positive measure subset of SL2C, can you say anything? Um, does the same does the same objection work? I don't think so because uh, uh, the, 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 yeah I don't think I think the, the same objection doesn't. Work. Okay, more more questions, comments. If there are no more questions, comments, let's thanks again. Professor Michael for very uh, interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I want to make an announcement for the next seminar. Uh, the next Thursday we will have a talk by Professor Louis Rowan from Barilan University. He will speak on finitely generated axial algebras. So, thank you, everybody. Ivan, Ivan, may I ask a yes. question? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm working on, on an, another subject re related to this one, but not, not so close. We are looking for conjugacy silasis on final simple groups of Lie type. And oh. we're looking for in some properties on these conjugacy classes. And we have a problem, and we don't know where a determinant conjugacy class generates the whole group or some subgroup. Do you know uh, if there are results in these directions for certain sim uh, simple groups? I don't know. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, let me, let me uh, ask again. So you're starting yeah. with a conjugacy class of a finite yes. subgroup, and you want yes. to know uh, whether so what is what is the statement you want about the conjugacy class and, and generating the group? What is the generation statement? You know, uh, we are working with racks. Some the the simple racks are say the examples are conjugacy classes of finite simple groups. Okay. So uh, we want to decompose the, the this rack into sub racks. Say, so we take an element in the conjugacy class and say if they generate. Uh, another conjugacy class in a subgroup of this group. So we, yes. we may split the conjugacy class in this in two. So there are the, when then we have some properties and then we make uh, some we have some consequences in Hopf algebra. Say. But uh, sometimes we don't know uh, if it, if the conjugacy class is in the composable or not because the, the 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 elements in the conjugacy class may generate uh, the whole group or uh, the or uh, another group which is uh, we, we cannot handle so we are working with determining the 
with certain groups, not the, the whole bunch of groups, the infinite, the infinite uh, list. So it's very precise question. I don't know how to pose it uh, in good terms, but we don't know the answer about uh, which is the probability to generate the whole group or just a small group. And it's a, it's, the group is smaller, which, which is the probability to be a certain list of groups. Yeah. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I do understand the, the kind of okay. question you're asking. Um, I think I would need to, to, to um, more detail about, you know, like, you know, a sample question of the kind you wanted to answer because it's it's so general, this, this question. Um, yeah, okay. Why don't you say, why don't you say, oh, okay. Heard, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, say, just a, a simple example. Yeah. I have two elements in SO. It's a simple group of a Chevalier type. Uh -huh. SO, say, SO, I don't remember the four or, or maybe bigger. Then I take two elements in the same in simple class and then they generate dihedral groups. And I don't know why. I can compute them. They are dihedral groups, but I don't have an idea why. I cannot prove it. It's, ah. it's a general fact or not. So, so you're uh, saying any two elements of the same conjugacy class are going to generate yeah. this conjugacy class. In this in this particular conjugacy class, it's not, not a, any conjugacy class. Generate, I just, generate a, a small yeah. proper subgroup. Yes, but there are the hydride groups that are for some reason bad for us. So yes, but I don't know the answer why so, this happened. It seems to happen uh, all, all the time. So I, I think there is <laughs> I think there is some literature um, about. I mean, there, there's of course a big literature about when two generate yeah. when two elements of a, a finite simple group generate. Of course, most pairs do, um, but there, there mm -hmm. are much more refined results where you put constraints on them. For example, you know, they're conjugate to each other. Um, yeah. Whether you whether people have gotten so far as to talk about um, which conjugacy class the two elements lie in and, and still prove theorems of this kind, uh, I don't know, but there is there is some literature. So um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'd be curious to see the example you have in mind. Uh, I can't think of a, uh, an example where of a conjugacy class which has this Ah, you know, if 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 the conjugacy class consists of elements of order two, uh, that, that I guess would explain why you get a, a dihedral group. Yes, yes, um, yes. We have problems with order two. Yes. I see. I see. <laughs> except I that. except yes. for that, does this phenomenon ever occur? Uh, uh, no, there are exceptions. In, in, except for that, uh, we know the other. Okay. Okay. So that's, I guess, yeah. Yeah, but, but okay, I will try to write you a, a good question in, in an email. That's that sounds great. I look forward to it. Yeah, okay. Good. So, thank you very much. Nice to meet you. In any nice case, to meet you too. Some, somehow related to Dr. Thompson conjecture. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's still open, so. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> now that's why. Yes, I mean, this actually is, <laughs> this is something we're thinking about. I mean, um, the kind of character estimates that that um, we, we use for for um, groups of Lie type um, are, are certainly relevant uh, to Thompson's conjecture, but the same kind of difficulty of how do you get elements with, with where the uh, centralizer is very large, how do you show that they are covered as well? You need some technique, something like a construction, to do that. And so we have some ideas about this, and in some cases we can do it. But uh, I mean, there aren't that many cases which are. Um, which um, this is uh, this is work with TF. There aren't that many cases which are still open, um, and some of the cases which were open, we can show asymptotically. Um, uh, Thompson's conjecture is true. Uh, for example, symplectic groups. Uh, I think we can we can deal with all with all the remaining symplectic groups with finitely many exceptions. Um, but uh, but it doesn't seem to work in all cases. So even even an asymptotic version of Thompson's conjecture, Thompson's conjecture with finitely many exceptions, uh, we can't do. Okay, more questions, comments, more discussion. Okay, thanks again, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
the next stop for we roll will be on the next Thursday. So bye bye everybody.